escalating conflict between the state and federal government at the border. Texas has uh, the legal authority uh, to, to control ingress and egress into any geographic location in the state of Texas. The state blocks federal law enforcement from one part of the Rio Grande. We look closer at the stakes and the response. I think it's a failure to follow and execute the law, uh, the failure to detain and remove those coming into the country illegally. New progress in the plan to kick the Homeland Security Secretary out of office. Why concern about immigration has one influential congressman pushing for impeachment. Freezing weather in the forecast raises concerns about whether your power stays on. As we play ERCOT weather roulette, if we come up a loser, we come up a loser no matter what the governor says. Why state leaders and energy experts are offering assurance and caution. Produced from the Capitol in Austin and airing statewide, this is the award-winning State of Texas. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Josh Hinkle. An unprecedented move at the border as state law enforcement blocks federal agents from accessing a public park along the Rio Grande. On Thursday, the mayor of Eagle Pass posted a video on social media showing DPS closing off the park to the public. Later that day, Border Patrol agents trying to patrol the area were blocked from entering the park. This is an escalation in an ongoing dispute between the state and federal government over authority to enforce immigration law. Governor Abbott said the state has the right to keep the feds out. Texas has uh, the legal authority uh, to, to control ingress and egress into any geographic location in the state of Texas. Uh, and that authority is being asserted uh, with regard to that park in Eagle Pass, Texas, uh, to maintain operational control of it. On Friday, the Department of Homeland Security filed a memo with the U.S. Supreme Court saying the state's actions are hampering their operations along the Rio Grande. There's a lot here to unpack. For perspective, I spoke with Sandra Sanchez. She covers South Texas for our border report team and has been following the developments in Eagle Pass. So we saw the Eagle Pass mayor post a video on Facebook saying that DPS took over a city park. What can you tell us about this park? Why is this significant? Yeah, it's Shelby Park, and it is 35 acres. It's the only public boat ramp for the entire city of Eagle Pass. Eagle Pass is a tiny border town of about 28,000. Not tiny, but it's a relatively small South Texas town. Families like to go to Shelby Park and celebrate holidays and birthdays, crack cascarones at Easter on each other's heads. It's, it's a real gathering place. It's also the parking area for downtown shopping, as well as people who want to go across the bridge, who want to walk across the bridge to Piedras Negras, Mexico. So I've been told by locals that they've lost all of their parking spaces, that parking is free, um, and downtown merchants could suffer as well. And, you know, they, they have nowhere to put in their kayak or enjoy the river. Thursday night, DPS blocked federal border agents from entering the park to process migrants. You've covered enforcement all along the border. Have we ever seen this level of conflict between state and federal entities? No, we, we really haven't. I mean, it's been coming to a boiling point um, with the border buoys that were put up with the fact that federal agents were um, taking wire cutters to cut down some of the wire fencing in order for them to get to migrants. So it's kind of been leading to this point. It is a bit surprising though that it happened at Shelby Park this uh, recently because, you know, the numbers have dropped significantly of migrants trying to cross. One thing I, I didn't tell you earlier about Shelby Park is it is an area where you can look across to Piedras Negras and you see there they have a park there. A lot of people, migrants who are trying to cross into the U.S., will stage themselves right there, put themselves into the water. The water is very fierce and wide at that point, and they'll swirl down the river and end up a, a about a mile, a mile and a half on the U.S. side, on the other side. So they don't necessarily come out at Shelby Park, but but they come but they come down river. And so DPS agents several months ago um, took over the boat ramp, and um, that's where they are launching their boats. Uh, they have a staging area, and they're monitoring that section of the river. I was on a ride along with the Maverick County Sheriff's Office deputy actually the very first day that they took control of, of the area a, few, a couple months ago. And he was shocked that they wouldn't let him into the parking lot 
And he said, you know, this is my town. I don't understand what's going on. Um, so th they have clearly become very territorial of this spot at a time when the numbers are down. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we were seeing 4,700 migrants crossing per day into Eagle Pass. Now it's about 400 a day. Um, the Hope Border Mission migrant shelter is practically empty. Um, and so why, why do it right now? The park takeover comes just days after Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas visited the border. We've heard him say that the immigration system is broken. What was the reaction from local leaders and people living in border communities to that assessment? Well, they absolutely agree. And they're tired of being in the spotlight. They're tired of being highlighted. They don't want the only thing you know about Eagle Pass is that you see thousands of people um, in thermal blankets sitting in a field waiting to be processed. There's so much more to their community, to other border communities, and they're really tired of this. Um, they also really, they feel, they, they use the term political theater, dog and pony show a lot to me. Um, groups of politicians will come down from one side or the other, Republicans or Democrats, in a, in a group, as we saw recently, 60 Republicans came down and they'll just highlight, um, you know, everything that's wrong, it's chaos, everything that's wrong. And they really want solutions. Now, they, they agree that something needs to change, something needs to happen. Um, they want lawful immigration. I've, I've never spoken to anyone who doesn't agree with that. Um, they're just really tired of this happening over and over again. I think the more lawmakers come and understand that is helpful, but just spewing negative comments about the chaos and, you know, constantly repeating the rhetoric can be hurtful to the communities and they really want some solution. All right. Sandra Sanchez with Border Report. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. The Homeland Security Secretary called on Congress to act to address immigration policy, but some lawmakers want action that involves kicking him out of office. They're fed up. They think this man should be removed from office, um, and they want him impeached. Why one influential Texan is adding his voice to the efforts to remove Alejandro Mayorkas. As temperatures go down, will your power stay on? We hear from state leaders and energy experts to find out what you need to know before the storm. In Washington, Republicans in Congress are moving forward with efforts to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. His critics accuse him of not enforcing immigration laws. Texas Congressman Michael McCall is one of those critics, and as chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, his voice is influential. Politics reporter Monica Madden spoke with the congressman about why he thinks impeachment is the right move. Congressman McCall, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, obviously, big news in Washington this week is the um, House beginning the impeachment process of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Given your legal background, what specific actions or inactions from the secretary do you think warrant his impeachment, aside from his uh Rescind, rescission of the MPP policy, which you've talked about as being one of those key reasons that he should be impeached. Right. I, I think it's a failure to follow and execute the law, uh, the failure to detain and remove those coming into the country illegally, which is what Remain in Mexico did. And on day one, he rescinded that policy um, and went back to a, well, quite frankly, we've never experienced this kind of lack of law enforcement where you have 8 million people encounters um, with no legal status. You've had over 300 on the terror watch list come in, and we've had 150,000 people dead now due to fentanyl deaths. Many in the Austin area, by the way, I can't get into names, but you know, people, you know, friends of my kids from Westlake High School, um, they took what they thought was Xanax, was laced with the fentanyl, and they don't wake up. But going back to what the founding fathers envisioned, they didn't even envision a specific violation of a federal criminal statute. They didn't have very many at that time. They looked at, they talked about things like abuse of power and uh, neglect of duty, dereliction of duty. Um, Hamilton talked in the Federalist Papers about injuries done immediately to society itself, which clearly there's been a lot of damage to the fabric of America over the last two and a half, three years. 
due to the secretary's inaction and failure to follow the law uh, and also his just abuse of power. Uh, I, I tell you, back home, I deal as chairman of foreign affairs with a lot of other issues like Israel and you know Russia and Ukraine and China and the threat to Taiwan. But this is always the number one issue is the threat to the southern from the southern border. And how can we fix it? So uh, I'm a voice for about 800,000 people. Uh, they're very loud and clear what they want me to say up here. And that is that they're fed up. They think this man should be removed from office um, and they want him impeached. Which do you think would have more immediate results for the country when it comes to border policy, the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas or congressional reform on border policy? I know that's uh, something that you all are working on, but should Congress be more focused on trying to get the Secure the Border Act across the finish line? You know, I almost see them working in tandem together because it gives us leverage and strength to say, look, the American people are fed up with your conduct, with your abuse of power, your neglect of duty, uh, and they want you to do your job. So we're going to impeach in the House. It's not going to go anywhere in the Senate, probably, but you need to come to the table and change these policies now. Um, and now is the time as we're facing a potential looming government shutdown, which I, I never like those. All that does is hurts our national defense, our, our military. I'd far prefer to have a continuing resolution where we can get the business of government done, fund the government, and include a major border policy, uh, national security change of policy that will fix this border. We had this thing done when I chaired Homeland Security Committee. We literally had it to the point where we had stopped the flow into the country. We were going to build a detention facility in southern Mexico on the Guatemalan border that would process these individuals. And we finally had a system that was going to work. And then Mayorkas came in and changed everything. Democrats who support Mayorkas say impeachment is a power reserved for high crimes and misdemeanors. They say it should not apply to a disagreement over how Mayorkas does his job. There's much more to our interview with Congressman McCall, including his thoughts on the risk of a government shutdown and military action against Iranian-backed militants in the Middle East. You can see the full interview now in the State of Texas section of our website. Texas braces for an Arctic blast, but will your power stay on amid the sub-freezing weather? Why state leaders and energy experts are offering assurance and caution. And later, a final farewell to Eddie Bernice Johnson, the tributes from Texas leaders and national figures. Governor Abbott activated the state's Emergency Operations Center Friday to prepare for the winter storm that's now hitting Texas. He urged people across the state to prepare for weather that will bring some of the coldest temperatures we've seen in recent history. The governor's briefing covered things like making sure roads are prepped for the potential of ice and people have places to take shelter from the cold. But the concern many Texans have is will the power stay on? The state is expected to face record demand for electricity. Officials say the chance for rolling blackouts is low, but they're still preparing for the worst case scenarios. Our Ryan Chandler explains what you need to know. It's become an annual concern for Texans. Are they going to stay warm and are their lights going to stay on? What do they need to know this time around? Well, they need to know that this cold front is, is not expected to be as, as difficult or as bad as the one in February of 2021. I think the weatherization requirements for the electric power plants uh, have certainly helped. Since this freeze nearly three years ago, Texas has performed more than 1,500 inspections of power plants. State leaders are more confident than ever. Texas and the grid are better prepared than we've ever been. I think it's just a bit of a different uh, storm, but that doesn't mean we might not have issues. We're not out of the cold quite yet. ERCOT predicts a nearly one in six chance of rolling blackouts if conditions are as severe as the December 2022 storm. That one was not nearly as bad as February of 21 when ERCOT's own math said it was only a one in 20 chance of rolling blackouts. You know, once again, if, if as we play ERCOT weather roulette, if we come up a loser, we come up a loser no matter what the governor says. The good news is it shouldn't be as bad this time. It'll be a drier event. We're not expecting that much precipitation. We should be able to more easily get around to fix things should they break. Experts stress 
We all carry the weight of the grid. They say, don't ignore the calls to conserve if times get tight. If 10% of the state were to do that, that might provide enough leeway for the entirety of the grid to operate without rolling blackouts. Ryan joins us now. Ryan, you were at the emergency weather briefing on Friday. What are state leaders saying about the electric supply? They're confident. They're as confident as ever, Josh. I know Texans have grown conditioned to be a little anxious every time the temperature drops, and understandably so after that deadly uh, blackout of February 2021. But state leaders, including the governor and the CEO of ERCOT, say that this is a different storm and a different power grid. They say they've made changes that we've learned from since 2021 that will make us more resilient than ever. And they're not even calling for a conservation notice. They're that confident that we'll have enough energy to uh, weather this storm. Well, you know, the governor signed new laws to help pay for building new gas-fired power plants in Texas. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to help make sure Texas has enough power to meet growing demand, but the energy experts you talked to are skeptical. Why? Right, so the governor signed uh, a series of bills meant to increase the energy supply in Texas by incentivizing power companies to build more power plants. These plans could uh, cost as much as $18 billion by giving out loans to energy companies uh, to tell them, hey, come to Texas and build your power plants here. Um, the governor said that they already have dozens of projects in the pipeline uh, meant to put more energy online in the coming years and decades. Uh, but you're right, some of the energy experts I talked to are skeptical that this is actually going to increase the supply of power because keep in mind, these companies are still operating under the laws of the free market and of supply and demand. You'll remember in February 21, uh, the prices shot through the roof because there wasn't enough energy and the demand was at an all-time high. So we saw a lot of price gouging, thousands and thousands of dollars um, for, for energy. Um, and, and some people argue that that is going to stick around because let's say you're, you're a power company with say 20 power plants and you only keep 12 online, well that allows you to control the supply and charge more, whereas if you put the extra eight on, then supply and demand would even out and you, you'd have to charge less for power. So while it might uh, control the prices for consumers, some are skeptical that this is actually going to make our supply more stable in the long term. All right. Well, I'm sure you'll be out reporting in this cold this week, so <laughs> I forget, hope not. Don't forget your gloves. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Ryan. Saying goodbye to a Texas trailblazer, we look at the high profile tributes to the life of Eddie Bernice Johnson and her lasting legacy. Leaders in the world of Texas politics paused to pay tribute to a political pioneer. A funeral in Dallas honored longtime Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson. Johnson died on New Year's Eve at the age of 88. She retired just months earlier after spending nearly 40 years serving the public. As Phil Prazen shows us, family, friends, and political leaders said goodbye to Johnson, but not to her legacy. Nurse, state lawmaker, regional health director, and ending her career as the chair of the House Science Committee. Eddie Bernice Johnson shaped policy and people from Washington, D.C. to Austin. Former Mayor Ron Kirk, Harris County Commissioner Rodney Ellis, and State Senator Royce West described her as their political mother, showing them the ropes as young public servants. Our matriarch has gone on. A matriarch is a person that has wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Proverbs. Eddie Bernice Johnson did that. Johnson's legacy will live on in the 2024 presidential election. President Biden and Vice President Harris will campaign on the CHIPS Act in part. That came through Johnson's Science Committee. As the first woman and the first black person to chair the House Science Committee, she worked to make sure that every young person in our nation, no matter who they are or where they live, can realize their ambition and aspiration and pursue a career in STEM. One of the first people to honor her Tuesday, her longtime friend and former president, Bill Clinton. And in 1992, when we went to Washington together, she was one of my closest allies for eight years. I'm so thankful that I had the chance to get to know her, to get to work with her, and to become her friend. 
House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries told a story about his first meeting of the Congressional Black Caucus. He now stands as one of the most powerful members of Congress. So thankfully, I caught A. Bernice's eye and she said, sit right down next to me, young man. And that's exactly what I did for years to come, getting the benefit of her wisdom, her warmth, her welcoming spirit. That was Phil Prazen reporting from Dallas. On Wednesday, Johnson was laid to rest in Austin at the Texas State Cemetery. That's one of the highest final honors for a Texan, reserved for those who've made a significant impact on the state. Family and friends said their last goodbyes at the ceremony, while Texas lawmakers reflected on the path she paved for them. She leaves behind such a, a big legacy. It's going to take a lot of people to fill her shoes, but the most important thing that we can do is to remember her and to be challenged to give and to do more for the constituents that we represent while we have a chance. Johnson was one of the founders of the Texas Legislative Black Caucus. In May of last year, lawmakers in both chambers honored her at the Texas Capitol for her decades of service. Thank you again for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle, and we'll be back next week to bring you an in-depth look at Texas politics.